Zig coming in on the top 10 on the show. We have Sammy K. Sammy K is a singer songwriter now based out of Cincinnati. Sammy's had an incredible musical journey that's led him to be in a lot of projects. But the two we're really going to focus on in this conversation today is the Sammy K band, his solo work, and the Kilograms, his most recent project, in which Sammy K teams up with Joe Gittleman of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones and Michael McDermott and Jay Duckworth to make an all-star Team Supreme band. The Kilograms have a self-titled EP out and they're on tour And one of their many stops will be at Mahal's in Lakewood, Ohio. That's September 4th, Mahal's, Lakewood, Ohio. It's going to be the Kilograms. Opening will be Rubik's Groove and my band, C-Level, letter C-Level. We are opening for the Kilograms September 4th at Mahal's. And we're super excited about it. It's going to be a super rad show. For us, it's going to be the first time back at Mahal's since the new uh, renovations, um... And we love playing with our homies in Rubik's Groove. So it's going to be a real fun night. So if you're in Lakewood, Ohio, September 4th, come hang out with us and watch the Kilograms rock the stage and blow the minds. Um, If you're not in Ohio, they're hitting some other states. There's a whole tour. If you go to their social media and their website, you can find the dates there. Um, And you're going to want to catch them because this might be the only run they do. Sammy gets into that. He gets into working with Joe and the other guys in the band. Uh, This conversation is a... Very songwriter heavy, um, which I very much enjoyed, and I think you guys will as well. One other thing I should note is the Sammy Band put out a new album, July 1960. It's available on all stream platforms. Lastly, before we get to this conversation, if you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast and any of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests like Sammy and sharing their insight with you. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Sammy K. Well, to jump into it, I guess to kind of just uh, to, to, to be on point with Ohio, um, punk or er, er, drunk and pumplic, ah, fuck the punk and drublic fest had a uh, had a fair amount to do with the kilograms, right? Uh, yeah, that was um that was the first time that me and Gittleman really um sat and bullshitted. We we had crossed paths before, but that one was like a not a turning point, but it was like, oh, shit, what's up, dude? You know, like we knew each other's names and it was like, oh, it's good to see you, you know? Okay. Um, and that's kind of where we started uh, going back and forth on like just checking in after that. Um, and I, I, I did like one more show and maybe two more with the boss teams after that. And then um, and then. uh and then this kind of all fell into place years later, you know. And now, what project were you? Were you in the Boss Tones? Because you've done like a million no, things, no, no, no. and like I've I have done a million things, but the Boss Tones were never one of them. Okay. Uh, Joe, Joe, uh, I was in at the time, just like this solo band, I guess you want to call it, the Sammy Band. Okay. Um, and I've been doing that. Uh, 2010 2011 something like that some some iteration of sammy and uh um we put out a record maybe 10 days ago a new one always always working uh six six lps i think and you know damn near close damn near close to 100 songs you know so okay is one of so july 1960 that's not the sammy band that's just you right that's that's the current iteration of okay it, yeah uh okay. we got we got quiet I, I i got really burnt out on rock and roll uh punk and 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 uh the songs that i was writing weren't lending themselves to that uh about five years ago and it just slowly started getting quieter and quieter and, and more delicate um which isn't a bad thing. Right. No, Thanks, not at all. Man. Like, and I think, I think punk is that and rock and roll is that but there's just more, there's more in the way of, of, of that. Like there's more take yeah. it. Like there, if you really examine it, it's, it is quiet and delicate and beautiful, but also there, there's the, the show aspect of it, which kind of hides that. So I guess, um, to kind of like, uh, bounce around i kind of let can you walk me through some of your history here so like 
when you started, all right, like, cause I, I like when you started singing and playing, was it songwriting always the goal or was it to be in a band? Um, I, I think it was really just to leave my hometown. I think that's yeah. really the, the long and short of it. Uh, um, I started getting in the van when I was 15 with some bands like roadieing, selling t-shirts. Uh, and we would like rip out through the Midwest a lot in New England from Jersey. And, uh, uh, I grew up in North Jersey, which is, you know, maybe the, the opioid epidemic capital these days or that back then. And it was just a way to get out. And I knew that, uh, my brains and my beauty and wasn't going to do it. Um, and I just started getting on the road. Um, uh, pretty much left high school and got in a van. I was playing in a rock and roll in like a rock steady band called the fourth rights. Uh, I was working for a bunch of bands, uh, like over the years, it was like the slackers for a long time. And I worked for the Scatolites for a bit and left over crack and did a bunch of festival work too. Uh, I worked for like essentially Travis Scott's merch company for damn five or six <laughs> years. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then I also played in all like pretty much all the slacker side projects, played guitar for the Dave Hilliard and RC seven. I played, guitar for Vic and hung out with Vic a whole bunch kind of rambled and wandered. Um, fuck. I played guitar for the pie tasters for a bit. Uh, I'm still kind of working for them whenever it's like fun, I guess fun, I yeah. guess would be the term. Uh, like if they do something cool, I'm like, I'll, I'll meet you there. Like I'll come and work for the weekend. Um, but it's really just to like hang out and go and get out back. <laughs> um, cause that's, that's what we do. We listen to records and eat out back. Um, um, but that's, that's what a 20 year fucking friendship is. Like, what do you want to do? You want to go play shows? Yeah, I'll come. But like, can we get out back? You know, <laughs> uh, but um, th that's kind of, that's beautiful yeah. because like, you know I mean? That is what like I, I think of going to the late night diners after the gig around here. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the thing, knowing you've done the thing, you the, the share that experience and get get out what you have in you and just play and be with friends and then go celebrate and be goofy at a late night diner or listen to records. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, those are the moments that matter. Like, I mean, the shows do too, but those are like, I, okay, I, no, the, I, I, the I shows, highlighted it too much. Um. <laughs> the, shows, the shows don't matter. I mean, they do, but they don't. The shows are the means. Yeah. Um, you know, putting out records is just a means of telling a story. And, and I could just sit at a bar on a Saturday night and ramble to some buds and do that. But um, the records and the shows are a means to broadcast that to a further place, you know? Right. It's almost like the inspiration is those hangs that then becomes a thing That's, to broadcast. Honestly, that whole 1960 record is all written off of dumb things my friend of, friend said at fucking 11.30 at night at a bar after a half a dozen high lives. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a couplet from every song. I would just pull out my... I, had, I always had my phone on the table. and somebody said something dumb, I'd write it down, and then I'd go <laughs> write it. Right? Like, uh, uh, How Fast to Run, uh, you know, slim, slim chance that you'd say yes was one of them. Um, Southern withdrawals. I watched a dude fucking try and try and stand up to some asshole in a bar and just shout, I ain't afraid of dying. Like you want to fucking go. Uh, like that line, like I wish I could get stoned and listen to just, uh, I just want to smoke a bong and listen to disintegration turned in. I just want to get stoned and listen to love song. Like, I can do the whole record. It's all based off of dumb things my friend said. The, the, you uh, portray it in the most beautiful way. But that that make you know, those dumb things are beautiful. Those things are like, yeah, you, you know that, what I mean? that Those are the bits like, that... For, for all intents and purposes, like that record is a joke to me. It was just making fun of... It was, it was acknowledging my friends that I enjoy hanging out with and telling stories based on life. Uh, based on those nights, uh, they were, they were all pretty much written 
Like if I got home at midnight, like that song was written by two in the morning. Like we just were hanging out a whole lot. It was a good summer. So, uh, so, okay. Walk me through that kind of a little bit. Like when, um, now you had a really interesting concept I heard called disassociation blues. That, yeah, that that's, right? that's what I do. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. I just kind of, uh, ramble. If you, if you know, I, I stopped drinking a long time ago. And, uh, and, the, and the truce usually comes out after a dozen beers, right? How you're really feeling. Right. Uh, so I just started disassociating at night after I got home at two in the morning. I'd play like a GCD or 145, whatever, and just disassociate and let whatever comes out come, come out. Um, and, uh, and that's how, you know, it's, it's no different than a drunk drunken bro doing the I love you man you know or the the, the late night uh, rendezvous of, uh, of a drunken Saturday night you know well I think there, there's a little more intent maybe with it <laughs> like you're sitting there ideally uh, you know to get something out songwriting wise to kind of like so maybe there's yeah. a little more intent but I, I get what you're saying like it's just that that fumbling of not even thinking about it and just it it spills out the truth comes out. Yeah, yeah. How you're really feeling, what, what you want to say, you know? Uh, has that like, yeah, that's, has that always been like your, your, no, main, no. Okay. What would you do no. for what? Like <clears throat> I used to sit down and write, I had a desk, I like did the thing I carved out time and like, it was like not pencils down Friday, but like I just wrote, uh, I'd find a feeling or a thought or whatever, and I'd just free write, find a couple of solid phrases, or I'd have a hook in my head, um, and then just go. Um, and uh, it became a little forced. Uh, I felt like I was telling the same story over and over again, and I like I was so focused on writing that I forgot about living, and, and the whole point of like telling stories is to live. Right, Woody right. Guthrie would be nothing if he just stayed at that fucking apartment in Oklahoma. Right, nothing. Yeah. The journey was was what made Woody Woody. Right, right. You know, any of these guys, these 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 old folk guys. You know, Dave Van Ronk was a prolific songwriter, but the journey through his life is what made him a songwriter. So. I found myself like I found myself just writing the same shit. Like, oh, I sobered up. This sucks. My girlfriend broke up. I'm okay. Here's some, you know, uh, <laughs> similes, and and I'm gonna paint a picture and say the same thing for the tenth time. And then I I realized that you can't really fucking tell stories if you're not living. And then I just let them come. Now, if I have a good night, I sit and try and write. If I have a good day, I try and write. You know, good, bad, you know, whatever it is. Uh. That's, I think that's, uh, honestly, that's advice I need to hear. <laughs> like, cause I, I've, I've recently been getting really much more, uh, tuned into writing. Right. And like learning all these different techniques and practices and trying to just really hone that craft. And I, I, I there's, there's no techniques. There's, yeah. Like there's books that'll tell you what to do, but like listen to records, listen to your favorite songwriters, see what they do. Listen to the greats, see what they do figure out the fuck you want to do, hmm. you know, yeah. like the times they are changing was already written, you know, like That's some true. of those books are just like, this is how you be Dylan. It's like, well, Dylan exists. Like, right. And to be fair, Dylan hasn't really done anything prolific since fucking 1982 when it was a gospel record, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, the, like infidels is like maybe his last really good record. I mean, you got time out of mind, but like, and the Wilburys, but that doesn't count because there's a Beatle and fucking Roy Orbison involved in Tom Petty. Right, you got right? Like, but a like Team Supreme <laughs> shit. Yeah, you know if what that I mean? Failed, like, like that's a lot gonna... of those. If that failed, something's wrong with the fucking world. That's what I was gonna say. Like if that, failed, <laughs> you know, we're all screwed. <laughs> shit. Um, but um, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah, like now these days, like I listen to a lot of Paul Simon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to understand because he paints a picture 
he tells the story, he makes you feel, he makes you think, right? But it's so pop driven, no matter what style of music he plays it in. Whether it's, you know, the Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, like, or like Cecilia. Right. It's the same writing, you know, it's the same story. Uh, <clears throat> versus listening to like a lot of spring scene, which is like, for me, that's life, but like, you know, I'm God, I'm the state of New Jersey is going to shoot me. He hasn't put out a really great record in 20 years, you know, yeah. it's, like a really solid crop. There's, there's gems, but there's not like, there hasn't been a solid crop since the rising. And that was right. 01 or 02, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was a hell of a record. Um, um it's a, I listened to last night, hell of a fucking record. Yeah. You know? I remember uh, um, that was my intro to Bruce. My buddy showed me that that tune in particular, and I was like, "I, th- I think he showed me a live cut, like a, a concert cut." I'm like, "Oh, I get it." Yeah, you know what I mean. Right there's there's great stuff on all the rec on Magic on 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 High Hopes on all those records, right? Uh, Western Stars, but there's not a solid crop of ten songs or twelve songs. You know, what do you, do you like? Uh, it's it is interesting, like. The, the kind of like uh, the fire burns really hot at first and then kind of kind of flickers with some artists, you know, it's really it's in- interesting. Some, not everyone like stays that same flame. And all, that also makes sense because you're growing as an artist and you're changing your perspective it's, is changing. Like uh, it's no different than baseball, right? You got a batting average and you got a slug percentage, you know, mm-hmm. That's that's really it. Like you can swing and cool. Like some of these guys, we play this game at the bar. Like batting averages on bands. Uh, like Credence is the greatest metaphorical baseball player ever. Like Fogarty, those four and a half. There's like they did what five records. Four and a half of them are fucking epic. That's true. You know. Yeah. And when Fogarty hit the ball, it was fucking out of the park home run every time. Like. And to be fair, like there's maybe six bad Creedence songs. Fogarty didn't write them. Right. The other guys did. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? That's yeah, that's that's your that's your babe Ruth of rock and roll, right? But yeah, it's it's it also you know, a lot of those guys it becomes work. And when <laughs> when, when work falls in line, it, it's like where's your passion? It's like are you seeing dollar bills? Are you seeing uh a solution for somebody to hear something and solve whatever's going on in their life, you know? Right. So, um, so is that kind of like, so you're doing all these work side projects with the slackers and like we kind of bounce back to your story. Um, is it, did it reach a point like that with rock music where it felt like work and that's when it became more introspective in that way? Uh, yeah. Um, it was also about the time that COVID hit. Okay. And I, I mean, it always was like, I hate using the word work. Like there were like two or three years in a row. I did 300 plus shows in a, year, in a row, like in a year, like home for three weeks for the whole year, jumping from band to tour to band to tour to whatever. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely work, but I was like real young and I was real high and I didn't matter cause I could just get fucked up every night. Right. <clears throat> um, but, um, uh, and it's weird, like my brain shifts, like I'm in work mode now. Cause it's like, you put out an EP, there's another thing, another couple things at press with a couple projects. And it's like, all right, I got to put down the pen and paper and focus on like the bullshit aspect of like booking shows and marketing and like dealing with social media. So like, I haven't written in two months. Ah, that's not true. I started writing again this week. I was like, I need a mental health drink. Uh, so I think I wrote like four or five songs in the last two weeks. Shit. Just sitting, uh, yeah. letting them out. So and then I got a couple that I'm like co-writing with, if that makes sense. Okay. Like Gittle, Gittleman and me are going back and forth trying to write some new Kilogram songs. And it's like, all right, cool. Like, here's a chorus. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll fuck with this. Like, what do you think for the bridge, you know? Uh, and is that, pro- I guess like, so is the co-writing thing new for you? Or is this a yeah? Pretty com- for the yeah? most part, okay. I've never, never, uh, I've done like co-writes in the sense of like helping people with their records, and it's more of an edit than a co-write. Like 
mm-hmm. buddies would send me songs and they'd be like, what do you think? And I'd be like, okay, cool, blah, blah, blah. Let's, you know, if you flip this line in the chorus and you change that chord, it's going to give you a better rise. And if you flip your pronouns, it'll change the narrative and make it an even better story or this, you know, like I, you, me, we, us, they, them, right? Your pronouns. Right. He, she, um, they, uh, if you flip, if you write like, uh, you know, um, I was just talking about mine. Uh, he's got a great hook. It's like, a, uh, I feel so tired as I lay in my bed. And that's like a great statement. But if you flip it, I feel so tired as he laid in my bed. Like that's a whole nother narrative. Right. You know, well and while are the same syllable, right? It's almost the same word, but well is uh, current and while is like a, a, somebody telling a story. You Post. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or an outsider, you know? Um, that little things like that can completely change. So I'll do a lot of those with Buds. So, um, I, but like co co writing, co like me and Gittleman like sit and write songs together. Gotcha. For the most part. Okay. So like, um, with, I want to pick your brain about that that really quick before before leaving it. So like, do you feel like there's a more like there's more of an impact if it's like happening in the moment in the song compared to like a, a telling of what happened? Uh, I think it depends on the narrative and the topic and the story you want to tell. I mean, the, the best thing about songwriting is there's no rules. Right. You know, the right. best thing. And like the best thing about songwriting is you can write something and have it like I got, I could write, I'll write you a love song tonight about a cheeseburger and you'll <laughs> never fucking know it's a cheeseburger. <laughs> and like, like, and nobody needs to know it's a fucking cheeseburger. You know what I mean? Right, right. That's a like that's it. That sounds like a an inc- incredible feat to be able to pull. <laughs> like, like if you flip back on my records, like love letters is not about a girl; it's about a guitar. I sold a guitar, Fender P bass. Yeah, like that whole song is a love story about losing something and having it go to California. I sold it to a buddy of mine that lived in fucking Port, and we were living on the East Coast. It went out west. There's nothing about that song that's about a person. Like love letters are like a, a fucking simile to the notes on a fretboard. Oh man, that's like, but that's like that's like master craftsman master craftsmanship, my friend. Like, because I've listened, I listened to all your solo records to get ready to chat with you, and like that's a beautiful song, but I didn't put together that it was about a guitar. <laughs> no, it's about a guitar, six strings, uh, four strings. It's a P bass. <laughs> American Standard. It, it was like a '99 or a 2000, something like that. It was like a limited dark graphite body, uh, you know, finish, maple neck. has has a sweet black flag sticker on the headstock. Yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, literally about a guitar. I guess you, that's. I, I think maybe that's the ultimate like goal as like a songwriter is to be able to put someone in that emotional experience, but make it so it can be their own. Yeah, it's to for me. It's to tell. It's to get off whatever I have to get off my chest, mm-hmm. like as a form of therapy, but make it uh, vague enough that they can relate, right? Like on the new on the new record on 1960, um, another letter to my former self. That's just I woke up and fucking I had a, a wild dream because I felt super true romance on. Like that's all that whole song is like about this dream I had just sitting there and, and about how like me and Alabama Worley are running around in the leopard coat and the blue, or the cowskin skirt and the blue top and fucking Robin Banks. But like, um, and it's all based off of that day. I saw a, a, a graffiti on a, on a wall that just said, darling, I miss you. So, and that just, that was in my head and I had this weird dream and fucking disassociate blues. There it is. All right, Alabama, I'll take you for a ride. You know? Yeah, man. But that's, that's but nobody, like nobody really gets that that's a fucking full on true, true romance. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like it's literally about robbing a bank, you know, <laughs> like, like driving from the house I was living at on Riverside Drive in Cincinnati to Northside, which is a neighborhood. Like driving up 75 to get there, you know, uh, taking the Coleraine Angus Avenue. Like that's, it's literally just talking about this metaphorical dream I had with Alabama Worley and fucking Robin the Bay. 
And across the street from that bank in the alley is where that darling and Missy So was. That's like, you know, yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. Like, and just even like you, you bringing up, these are some, a lot of the, these songs come from bits from hanging out with friends is like, yeah. You know what I mean? That, that that's that's like peak songwriting. <laughs> like, man, that's incredible. That's the same. That's yeah. the same day too as love song. Those two were from like the same twenty four hours. Same same events. So okay, so when you were like, when you have these these things you 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 take in, and uh, they're kind of floating around, and titles are popping or whatever, and you do a disassociating blues and like does it all kind of come together in that moment or is this kind of like you do this thing and then you come back to it and you're like, like, uh, here's my, my free writing, the disassociating part and like kind of pair it with like things that have been like, uh, just in your head, like a, a title that you read on a wall or something. Yeah. Um, a lot of them get, tend to get paired with statements or like a couplet that I had, like I'll do the free write kind of with like, the thought in my head of like, darling, I miss you so. Like for another letter, like I had, like I knew I wanted to, like, darling, I miss you so. And I've had Alabama in a fucking notebook for 10 years. Um, so some of that is like disassociate, but like I'll, I'll just put my iPhone in front of me with recorder and do it for 10 minutes and then the next day listen back. Okay. And if there's like a couple of couplets or, you know, uh, I also, I tend to only write in essentially a sonnet now. Okay. Um, I found that Americana and country and folk music, like I don't need to sit through a six minute song anymore. Like nobody does. Like you don't need to hear <laughs> yeah. a chorus. Yeah. You know, you don't need to hear a chorus 10 times and there doesn't need to be three pedal steel solos. Like, so I've been trying to write in sonnets, uh, which, you know, I, I don't know. I think a sonnet is 14. Like most of the songs on 1960 are only 12 lines. Okay. That's it. That's cool. Right. That's really cool. Like essentially yeah. like a two couplet verse, uh, two couplet tag, you know, or a two couplet, uh, chorus. So that's eight, a two couplet second verse or bridge or whatever you want to call it and then like a two couplet outro that's it fucking 12 lines you know yeah well man there's even just even thinking of it like that there's no fat right there's no there's fat no, one, everything needs to be so precise right but that makes lines like like on southern withdrawals like that's dude good that too. chorus that chorus is i'm not afraid of dying no more but this breathing seems impossible like that's not a chorus line that's a bridge line yeah. Right. That's something that you can really only say once, but having it be essentially what the chorus is makes the rise and the, you know, the fucking music of it, making it hit as a chorus makes it even more prominent. But if it was, a, um, a Jason Isabel song and he said that four times, it wouldn't have the same gusto as saying it once. Right. Right. You know, yeah, no, definitely. Um, and it, it's it, it's always interesting what kind of works like that. Did like okay, did the sonnet kind of like shape come to you uh come to you from like kind of studying other songs or is this what you just kind of found yourself doing? No, uh my buddy uh there's a guy here in town from East Los Angeles. Um uh I guess he's from Florida. Or, no, he's from LA originally. He was in Florida for a while. Uh Latino dude. And we were hanging out in the same bar in California, like 10 years apart. Um, in Downey, which is like where X and the blasters are from. This place called the Anarchy Library. Whoa. And he was telling me about um, corridos, which are like Spanish folk songs that are short and sweet. They're usually like quick. There's not no repeating choruses. And they're just like these quick little love songs. Um, like, um, God, what was that fucking Disney movie? Um, Coco. Coco, like that kid yeah. running around playing those like quick little. Blah, 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 that's like a, a corrido. Okay, okay. And that's what started it. And I started listening to corridos and like looking at the translations. Like, oh shit, this guy. There's no chorus. 
it's a good vocal melody. They're short, they're sweet, they tell a story, they make you feel, they make you think, and that's it. And Dang. then it's done. Yeah. But, it's done. There's wow. no there's no fucking I love Thin Lizzy, like the cowboy song would rule as a three minute song. You know? Yeah. Like they like it's essentially doing a radio edit, like trimming all the fat and just you know, you got three minutes, like keep it under three. But that that also kind of puts in the that kind of punk mindset where you don't you just have to say what you need to say. It doesn't need to be, you know, like how you said, fluffed up. That's that's really yeah. that's really interesting. That's really cool how you found it that makes, too. It makes your word choices and statements like on nineteen on some of them like I'll use the phrase like you know you know as a full line, like you know yeah. you know like with two different punctuations. And and that makes you fucking think, and that's the whole point. It's like, well, what, what are you, you? You know that line, that couplet is a. Uh, uh, God, what is it? Because you know we've been waiting for the time to just move slow. All the fast lanes and the express lanes ain't the pace we want to go. You know, because you know. Like that's it. Like, and that's that that that's a yeah. couplet that worked, you know, and it's a cheap run, but it's it's it makes that like holy shit, are we moving too fast? Are we going? Are we running? Like, cut down to be like, oh shit, okay, I gotta fucking pause and realize like maybe I didn't say thank you to the guy that held the door, earlier. you know, or like. Maybe I cut somebody off and like didn't give them a I'm sorry way, you know, like those are two great metaphors for this. Holy shit, man. Like <laughs> But yeah, just even though Yeah. And I'm even, sorry, I was gonna say just even that phrase well, you, first, you know you know, like that's that's something you would that's a conversation. You know, what I mean that's something you can hear yourself saying with somebody or hearing someone say to you. And sometimes I think Yeah, that's lines that's like, the whole point. Right, right, right. But sometimes just writing like that can be so challenging, you know what I mean? And then like that, but that that's that's just it, it just it's right there. So I don't think it's a cheap yeah. rhyme at all. Is what I'm trying to say. I think it's really wise choice. Word. Uh, my girlfriend's my girlfriend's kiddo has been listening to a lot of um, like kind of Midwest emo stuff. Okay. And um, a lot of like Chapel Rome is getting played a lot. And like, and I, I kind of don't see a difference between Chapel Rome and New West Emo. Um, I think the writing style is pretty similar, but they're very blunt, and there's not a lot of metaphors or similes. And and it's a cool way of writing. And, and I've been seeing a lot in pop music where they're pretty blunt. They're not leaving you uh, to think and like that that statement. You know, you know, like. That's a great, you know, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, you know. <laughs> it, it's it's just it's just it's just blunt, and it's 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 something you'd say in plain text to finish a statement, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really inter- that is a really interesting observation because a lot of music is at least a lot of modern pop, I guess, is pretty on the nose. But yeah, like it it is really it is really interesting that like that not loss of metaphor, but that just kind of like because I feel maybe. M- uh, not even no need for right, more. right. Uh, those choruses don't even don't even have it either. I would say maybe that's kind of where it's put, but like, but I, I guess that that really brings out that there is no rules thing, you know, and really yeah. highlights how powerful <clears throat> that statement is in songwriting. Right, like I uh, I like um, I love John Prine, right? right, and and the glory of John are the prineisms, these wacky little metaphors of life. And then you got a guy like Rustin Kelly, who's just as prolific as a songwriter already. And he's just, you know, instead of like the whole song of that's the way the girl, the world goes around by John Prine, you know, in the weakness, he just says, fuck that guy. He's just a piece of shit. We don't give him to the weakness. Like, that's just a blunt statement with no dancing around it. Whereas Prime, you know, 
I know a guy's got a lot to lose. Right, there's fucking twelve lines. Right. You know, which is great, and it's the glory of John. You know, but and it's it's really cool to think that like well, Russ ended it as well, just in this newer blunt. One honest, statement. Quick, yeah. One singular statement, right? Yeah. Not even a couplet. Singular statement. That it's it's uh, interesting because the couplet kind of like, it's kind of like that da 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 da. You know, it, it leads you to that you want to hear that resolve, and then there's that dopamine spike of ah, oh, I got to follow the trail and hear the who the get the rhyme, get right. the get the cadence, you know. Uh, and maybe this might be a, a, a stretch. I'm just spinning here, but maybe because of like how in society now we're more like. Uh, immediate response, immediate uh, dopamine spike. Maybe that kind of is being reflected to some degree in like super direct statements and like pop music like that. Not yeah, that one's better than the other, because I think they both yeah. hold the same purpose, right? But maybe that might be a, a strange, like uh, a skewed reflection of that. Yeah, um, totally. It's it's real cool with kilograms because. Joe Gittleman has been sending me choruses. And we both realized that he's a really big chorus guy. Like king of these banger choruses that are short and sweet and will tell a story and like and and he's now starting to send me like stuff like back thing like we're like here's a here's a chorus like tell your like you do your thing we can make this work with your stories and my choruses and vice versa you know or you know like i have one he sent me it's like i have the chorus and the bridge and nothing else you know that's cool and he's like go go you know and it and it's you know like uh can't be beat on the kilograms record was like that he sent me a chorus and like later in time i found it was like about like global warming and and I, I you know I I don't remember which president but Trump or Bush um, and I took it as like holy shit rock and roll sucks I want to go home I don't want to be on tour I wrote all the verses for that about like going the opposite way of where you want to be with this really well written you know low key anthemic chorus you know and um it's cool it's like you know different writing you know co-writing with folks like you, you kind of learn what your wheelhouse is you know yeah um, and 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 know how to really work your your wheelhouse like that's i mean that's a really cool like kind of like because i was gonna ask how your writing has been influenced by working with joe but it, it almost sounds uh, it's like completely different. Yeah, it's completely different. Okay, because um, I was gonna say it almost sounds like you guys just find the puzzle pieces that fit together. But also, I guess when he's sending you a chorus and a bridge, how does your like kind of sonnet approach uh, apply to that, or is it a whole different frame? <clears throat> no, I I just try and write a sonnet. I yeah. try and write eight to twelve lines, um, and make it work, and try and figure out and then i'll trim it if it's 12 lines like i'll usually write six lines i'll write four verses and then i'll i'll so i always know how to start a song uh, my second and third verses are, are tend to be a lot weaker than my first lines so i'll write four verses and cut it down to two and figure out like you know maybe the first couplet of the second verse and the second couplet of the fourth verse makes a really epic second verse. Um, it always seems like that the middle of it, the second verse, the the part where you're taking this, the, the people you introduce or this narrative and trying to like expand upon it, but make it work with the chorus that you have. That always seems to be a really tricky spot to fill. Oh, it's, I, 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 I I am the worst at second verses. I'm okay at third verses. I can sum up the story, but like trying to figure out that middle line is like that middle piece of the puzzle. Like I know the start and the finish, but like where do we go? 
you know? Yeah. And that's why, like, on my records, like, and I, I, I'll fucking admit it, like, my intro, like, my first verse and my choruses are, are, are dece, and then my outros. That's why I do a lot of rambly writing in the outro, like, full, like, essentially third verse written on the outro. And that finishes the story. <laughs> and uh, and it kind of lets me... Um, I don't want to use the word lazy, but um, it lets my second verses kind of relax because I know there's there's a bridge and a chorus, a strong chorus and, a, and an okay bridge and a pretty strong outro. Even if the outro is just a couplet on repeat or a statement on repeat, like it sums the, the thing, you know? Right. It's, it's interesting. It's like the opposite of like in films or stories. Usually the third act is the hard one to, f- to to come up with. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. But it seems like the first act for me is just like you know, you uh you, you figure out where you are and you tell the story, right? Like um I wrote a song recently uh a couple of my buds will will text each other songwriting challenges and uh um the song is was it was to write a song about a Bruce Springsteen song. Whoa. Okay. Songception. <laughs> songception, right? Yeah. So, oh, I was like Thunder Road, right? But how do you, how would you write a song about how Thunder Road makes you feel, right? Right. A perfect, uh, there's a couple. Um, God damn it. It just slipped my mind. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my notebook. Uh, the perfect moment starts with a subtle breeze while the screen door slams right there in front of me. You pound it out on black and white keys, right? Like that's like the first three, like, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about right away. Right. right? Um, um, it just sits, you know, like that was how, you know, I, and you can paint like those, you know, perfect moment starts with a subtle breeze, you know, a perfect moment, you know, like, you know, exactly where you are. Right. Right. What you want to do. Um, I'm trying to see if I can, I don't even have it in my phone. I think it's in notes and like voice memos. Um, but, uh, Cause like, it's, it's, yeah. so, it's interesting. Like I find for myself, like finding moments like that, finding like, like and at, not to the degree you are because you got way more time put into it, and and practice. But I I find myself having an easier time setting up a moment like a statement that you can relate. But but, but trying to arch that narrative, um, sometimes like when it's a free the ride, narrative is the hardest part. Okay. Um, you, you know you got to figure out the feeling, or what you want to feel, or what you want to. It not even feel like get off your chest, right? Because um, at the end of the day, like songwriting is essentially therapy, right? Right. We can spill whatever we want in whatever metaphors and not have to pay somebody $140 an hour to sit in a chair. Um, um, and and th- those that know, like you know what it's really about, but but they don't know. Right. So, so the narrative, you know, uh, I'm a 12 stepper, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, when you do your fourth step, you know, it's like the person, your resentment, what it affects and where you stand in the, in the, in the situation, you know, like, what did you do? Um, and in that third column, it's like ego, pride, personal relationships, fiscal relationships, like things like that, right? Um, <clears throat> I try to find one of those and like, well, I want to write about my pride, right? And then it's like, well, it was hurt by the situation and that's my narrative, right? Mm. Like, okay, like, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, you find you find what you want to write about. You find what feeling you want to attach it to. And like the four step example is real cool because like 
say, uh, Jimmy over there, you know, he called me a fucking asshole, right? So you can write your first verse about, you know, the situation, you know, driving back from old Long Beach with the summer air in my hair, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you hit your chorus and it's like, all right, yeah, fuck yeah. Like my feelings were hurt and this sucks. This is a Midwest emo song now. Fuck, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then by your third verse of your bridge, you realize what you did to piss him off. Right? Which is the fourth column. Okay. So then it goes inward to like a, a self And then it goes inward, right? right? Yeah. And then like there's your self-reflecting statement of um, the realization, the uh, the coming to you of knowledge, whatever, however you want to phrase it, or you know, right? But there's a song, there's a narrative, you know. Uh, or like, a lot of times, like, I have like some characters that are on six song story arcs. Yeah, like that go back, like Cecilia starts on Untitled. Uh, Secrets is like kind of about this character and then she's all she interweaves throughout Civil War and like Sweet Cecilia is like her swan song and like I essentially kill her off then years later I write better worse and it's you know in my head was kind of about her funeral right it's about cleaning up the house and getting rid of the junk and sorting the mail and settling the, the estate right right and then better way is her still in the picture alive like she figured it out she, you know in a nutshell she went to rehab and that last line of the record is right the last line of sweet cecilia um uh, now the streets and the stars all the way to you know just let it go right Better or worse is um, it's going to get better before it gets worse. Uh, do, you, do you, God, what the fuck is it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I get it's about it's about the procession of people leaving, right? Mm, okay, okay. A funeral, like a procession. Um, God, I can't even fucking remember the line. Um, and then better way ends it's so damn hard to hide behind these scars right it's a realization that you're human and you're fucking broken that's like i mean i know these are all coming from different different songs but like that's an incredible like twine of a the journey full, yeah yeah like she's in something like nine songs in the last seven years or something like that eight songs she's in the picture that i have in my head right she's in the bar. So, I, and it, like with with that string of a narrative in particular, like when you're thinking about it or just like kind of disassociating and writing whatever comes, is it kind of maybe like a in those cases like a focused disassociation on this character? Does that make sense, or is it kind of like uh, a reflection? Yeah. Later? Here's 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 where it gets weird, right? Uh, I'm a schizophrenic. Okay. Um. Um. I have like schizoaffective disorder. It like lives in my mind and I, it projects every once in a while, but like not often. Yeah. But Cecilia is the voice in my head that tells me to go get fucking high. Mm. So I started writing about Cecilia before I got this diagnosis, before we figured out that like, oh shit, you're not supposed to have eight voices going on in your head at the same time. And I like essentially killed her off via meds and therapy. And then I, I stopped taking meds and went on like a really hard therapy regimen to understand how it works. Um, and uh, that's when I sort of realized, like, oh, shit, like Cecilia is in my head. Um, and she was silent. I right. didn't hear from her for like after bed, after I finished Better or Worse during COVID, I didn't hear for, from her for like two and a half years. And I was in the shower and that's where those lines that have you seen the have you seen this angel, the siren of the streets started popping up. And like I got out of the shower, dried off, and like started doing the disassociation and letting it ramble. And that's that whole song wasn't edited. 
Whoa. At all. That's just, I'll find the fucking thing and like show you. It's. I believe it, man. How it came out. Like, I didn't even flip a pronoun. That's just like done. You know? Yeah. What did uh, like. 12 lines. Damn. Well, also, like, from practicing this so intensely, too, you know what I mean? And so, like, making it part of your practice of what you do, like, it, it eventually you're going to hit a home run without trying, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, those are the best ones, though. Right, 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 right. Uh, and they feel the best because you finished it. And, like, but, like, that's a really interesting, like, one, that's an incredible feat. Um, just even to kind of put a pin in it but just doing the recovery and going through the 12 step and like taking therapy and like really honing into this and learning how to craft all these things and work through all of it in like such a positive way and put it out you know that's an incredible feat by itself but when it sounds yeah. as cool and is as beautifully written as as you do it that's a whole nother level of it man that uh what's that old country song if you if you're gonna be dumb you gotta have luck yeah <laughs> that's not the worst of that song no a lot of it's just dumb luck yeah be man. tough right <laughs> yeah a lot of it's just dumb luck man that's kind of how it is uh you, you get a couple couple lines and like i'm an okay writer i don't think i'm the greatest fucking thing but i can i can hang i think i can hang in a, a, a room full of peers and and write a comparable song to some friends that have gold records you know that's pretty but, um, that's that's come on man that's a good statement right there come on like to be able yeah. to do that you know what i mean like but also yeah like I, I, but i also have four thousand written songs <laughs> and some facet in my phone in voice memos you know there's probably two thousand songs there and maybe 30 of them are really good mm. you know right Right, but that I, I have a feeling that most of this is like a numbers game in that sense. Like, oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely like. And if you're not, Mary Oliver has a a bit that I've been trying to live by, being like, if you don't, it, it inspiration comes to those who show up. It's something like, along those lines, um, meaning that you have to show up and do the bit for for it to happen. If you don't show up, you'll never catch the fish, or you know whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, a base a baseball player's batting average is only based on his at bats. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll swing a thousand times in a season off. You know, thousands of times in a season practicing, but the only ones that really count are the ones on the field. True. Know? True. Uh, so I guess that's the metaphor for writing versus <laughs> records. True. Like I would, and just I don't know, man. Uh, getting ready to talk with you and diving into your music and drive, diving into any like interview I can find that you've done. I've I've left every one of them very inspired, in particular writing wise, and just having a whole new kind of frame of things to try. So like, I think you, I, in my personal opinion, man, you're fucking killing it. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best. Can I uh, on on a pin, um. Is even just like a one thing I find like because some of the kids I'm working with and some people I like and even for myself it took me a very long time to develop just a voice like just a singing voice that I felt like hey I can get behind how I sound right now and be like check this out I think this is okay this is I I accept this as good um, do you what do you think you know what I mean but like how long did it take you to find your voice because you have a very unique voice and it carries an insane amount of emotion um singing wise I'm, i should say i don't think i sang a song in front of anybody uh it took 10 years of being in bands and being on the road yeah 15 years of playing music before i was like i'm gonna sing a song um like i was 21 maybe or 22 when i was like i'm gonna start thinking about maybe singing in a band and i didn't even want to like like we were trying to find somebody else to sing and they're like no you should just do it uh that was like 2020 2012 maybe okay uh something like that yeah it was like 10 years of playing music and 
Um, and then that's where the shout, and then you can hear like Fourth Street. I started to learn how to sing Untitled. I started to learn how to control it. And then Civil War, I didn't want to shout. And then I got like pre COVID before it was COVID. I was in Europe and I was on like a hundred day tour right before COVID happened. Got real sick coming out of Canada. And I was down for like now, you know, now we call it COVID or whatever, but it was this weird virus. Uh, like I can't do what I did on Untitled anymore at all. Like not even if I pull it down like steps. Yeah. Uh, my, my, the growl changed and it's starting to come back, but like I'm working like, you know, for a half hour every day, like just kind of screaming in the basement, trying to see if I can get the strength back. It's an air thing. Like I don't have the air that I used to, um, uh, which is partially why everything got more quieter, but also all I was listening to was like guys like Woody Guthrie and, and, and Towns Van Zant and, um, old man billy bragg like he's not they're not shout man it, it, it's, it's that talking blues thing that that thing where you, you can you know raise your voice just a decibel or put just a little more grit in it and it fucking drives drives the point home right like i can sing now at 35 in like essentially my speaking voice and i couldn't do that 10 years ago it's it is so i kind of found that a similar singing journey in the sense like you 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 start off wanting to be like i love kurt cobain how do i sound like kurt you know what i mean or fill in the i don't love kurt cobain <laughs> but, but some people do well i'm trying i'm trying to like fill you know, like the screaming yeah, it, the, you know what i mean like or dave Grohl or someone who shouts for yeah. like you, and you get drawn in by this this yeah. strong vocal right for me it was like hot water music and yeah okay um you know that style of like postmodern hardcore like gotcha. the growl right the growl is what got me and springsteen does it too yeah like like the darkness on the edge of town springsteen is like my fucking shit yeah but what i love even more is the nebraska that's a great springsteen. record yeah you know like and that's kind of you know it's wild coming back to the kilograms and playing in like a louder band it's like trying to find this happy place of like being able to sing and being able to yell and really being able to hit and hold notes. Um, and, and get out of my comfort range that I've been in now for six years or something like that. You know? What is a, so what is, when you're a, when you're screaming in the basement, what does that look like to kind of help build your breath support? Is it like breathing technique? Is it like just elongating um, notes? Like, no, I pretty much just play nightmares. Okay. Like my song Nightmares. Uh it's the highest vocal range. The range on that is like an octave and a half or something like that. Somebody shit. told me. Okay. I don't I don't know shit, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> like the verse is a the pre chorus is um Cause I'll be right here by your side. And then the fucking Can you hear my heart be? Like I'm, I'm trying to get that note again, that, right. that top note. Yeah, and I can't. It's, it's, it's fucking. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of break, breathing. It's, it's going back to diaphragm versus like talking blues is all throat. Right, right, and that's that's you know? where it's supposed to be. That's supposed to be where it's real dangerous as far as like oh, hurting yeah. yourself. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's probably why it's shot. You know, and also like I was throating rock and roll. I was singing from my throat in the early years and there's no, like I could go four shows and then I, I wouldn't have a voice for three days. So I think a lot of it now is like learning like techniques. Like I keep telling myself I'm going to go to like, but like now I warm up. I never warmed up. I would just fucking smoke three cigarettes and sing a fucking Bruce Springsteen song and call it a day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 No, I definitely, I definitely think there's, there's definitely a thing to the warm up and the cool down. Like I, I've, I've recently given up coffee because I kept losing my head voice. <laughs> like, I've had three, I've had three cups while we've been on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I miss it. I miss it. Um, yeah. 
And I, man, I'm waking up early and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I yeah. miss fucking coffee. Um, on the road, I'm different. Like at home, I don't, you know, but yeah. I haven't really been on the road. Like I tend to eat worse, but I avoid like dairy and shit like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but at home, it's like, I'll eat ice cream and then go demo a song in the basement. You know, like. Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. Let's have a giant latte and sing uh, in the basement and write. Like, ah, uh, yeah, that's probably not good for me. Was it? Well, I mean, um, and like, it's different when you're not like living up to like, okay, it's showtime. I need to perform. You know what I mean? It's it's more relaxed for sure. Yeah. And it also, like, I learned like me shouting on stage isn't necessarily the problem. It's me like trying to talk to people in the crowd after. Yes. A hundred percent. Oh my God, dude. I totally agree with that. We just. We had a gig last night at the Grog, and like that was where I my love that place, dude. That's like I love that place. I'm like I'm stoked we're playing at Mahal's because we haven't played our band hasn't played there in years because they're all it's a whole different facility in there now. Um, yeah, yeah, and we're stoked to be playing with you guys for sure. But if we had the move in anywhere, I would definitely say we should have done it at the Grog. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. Uh, I'm stoked to be at Mahal's, and I'm not trying to badmouth Mahal's. We're but, not bad. Uh, we're not bad mouthing no, no, Mahal's. I'm we real love stoked. Mahal's. This is a recording of yeah. me and you both saying we love Mahal's, and it's such a cool <laughs> yes. venue, and we're super grateful to be there. I was, but I was if a it, little bummed. I was a little bummed that the grog was booked that night. So. We'll put it that way. It'll we be have so good. <laughs> we have right friends with at the, the kilograms. Grog shop. With with the kilograms, the whole mentality is that we don't know how many shows we're going to play. Yeah, we don't know if this band is going to be a band in six months, we're just having fun. Like none of us need to do this. This is just like me and Gittleman creating and Jay and, and McDermott and, and we're having fun. And the rule was like, when it becomes like proper, proper work for more than one person, you know, that's a true statement. I'm running essentially all the business side of it. And we're not even busy. We're just, there's a lot going on. Um, and, uh, but like we all said, when we're not having fun, like we're not doing this. Like if one person says, cool, like, you know, I don't, I don't, none of us need to be away. None of us have anything to prove. Right. Right, but that, you know, we're literally just essentially a bunch of old friends. Like Jay, I'm, I don't know how I met Jay, but we go back 15 years. Jay is engineer. Jay is engineer. Like and Anna, everything I've done in Cincinnati since I got here has been Jay. And this little test game tape machine for a, a two inch tape machine, right? Everything. And like Joe has nothing to prove. He's got. A, he's a college professor. Like. We don't need to get in the van. None of us need to get in the van, like, at all. And McDermott is a fucking legend. You know, I saw him two nights ago. He was playing drums for Joan Jett. That's fucking cool. Yeah, it's super sick, yeah. On top of, like, damn near close to 20 years in the Bouncing Souls, and then 15 years before that, floating around, like, quintessential New York hardcore and ska bands. Like, like, you know, I'm the youngest, and I'm 35, you know? Jay's 40, Durham and, and, and Joe are in, in their 50s. Like, none of us need to do this. So what we're trying to do is, while we're doing it, just make sure we play cool shows with cool bills and cool rooms. Like, shows that we would want to go to. Right? Because if right. four essentially grumpy old men who have been on the road collectively for 100 years, you know... More than if you put all of our road years as 110, maybe right? Gittleman since the early 80s, McDermott since the late 80s. Like me and Jay both have like this next year is 20 years since I've been in the band. I'm 35 years old, you know. Like that's a shit ton of fucking time, yeah. So if the bill is good enough for any of our any of the collective kilograms to get off our ass to go to the show. Like, that's the only rule. Like, badass bills, badass rooms, badass hangs. Because we don't know if we're going to play. We have shows up to the day. And nothing after that. 
we don't even want to think about it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no reason to go if you don't have to. There's so many bands that have something to say that could use that room more than a bunch of guys just trying to have fun. You know? Um, so that's like Mahal's is a great room. Like that whole run we're doing salties which used to be paul's in jersey and and our wicked lady is this beautiful outdoor venue in, in brooklyn and, and like everywhere we're booking is just like these killer rooms to see and they're small like i think mahal's is the biggest room we're gonna play minus boston like a massive loaded ship that's at like it's in the fucking garden. Like our first Boston shows in the fucking hockey arena. <laughs> Shit. Like it's in like, you know, they have like a theater attached to it. Like it's, yeah, in yeah, yeah. it's Damn. fucking wild. That's fucking you know? sick. But I, I, um, I love that this whole thing, like one, I think that's, you know, uh, I, I admire you're, you're kind of acknowledging this room could be used for someone who's doing something, but we're using it to have fun. I love that it is you guys are doing this project as a passion project for fun because that's we're the most that's what music's supposed to that's why we all get in the van right and like but also I I really admire uh note, noting that I think that's really really well said there's there's a thousand bands that could use that room more than us um and in the sense of having fun like I, if I never had to play another show, I wouldn't necessarily be mad. You know, I played one solo show this year and it was last week. Like July 19th was the first time I sang my song solo all year. I'm not mad about it. Yeah, yeah. But in that interim, granted, I had surgery and had to rebuild my elbow twice in the last 12 months. Oh, yeah. I saw, <laughs> I saw that. What happened, man? Uh, I took a spill at yeah. work oh, and I shit. broke both bones. Oh twice. God. Oh God, dude. Um, and there was a bunch of nerve issues, but like within yeah. the last like kilograms popped, we started doing kilograms in like November. Mm -hmm. uh, and between the kilograms, right? Me, Jay, Joe and McDermott. I think six or seven pieces of vinyl are going to come out this year. Sick. There's, Three full lengths, holy shit! A man. proper EP yeah. and like a couple other things that are on the dock to come out this year, like two or three seven inches, I think, by the end of the year. Like for four guys to release eleven fifty-five songs in a year on their respective, like, with the crew, like, that's fucking epic. That's, yeah, especially if, so, you said Joe is a college professor? Like, yeah, and he's a college yeah. professor by day. Holy shit, yeah, definitely, man, like, for, <laughs> like, any group that put out 10 songs is a feat, you know what I mean? Like, Dude, we, we ripped, we ripped 10 songs in, like, a matter of four weeks. Like, wrote from the start. Like, there's... Like our kilograms master list is like 17 or 18 songs. And we, um, um, and we, uh, and that's just kilograms. Damn. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It and granted, you know, eight or nine of them are out, you know, it's not like there's a, sh or about, you know, there's two on Gittleman's record that are technically kilograms. Five on the EP. There's a seven inch of press. You know, we essentially put out a full length this year on a couple different projects, you know, a right. couple different releases. Like, well, and that's what the thing I was going to say too. Like, you put out this record and he put out that record. And I'm, I, I don't know the other guy's outputs, but I'm like, that's, that's a lot of writing. <laughs> that's a lot of recording. And, you know, in like, that's not, no moments wasted for sure with your guys' worth ethic. Yeah. That's super fucking inspiring, man. Yeah, it's just uh um it's just it's a cool it's a it's a cool chance just to create. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's all that really matters, right? 
at least, you know, um, right. It's cool to watch the songs live and breathe. Yeah. No, for sure. But it's Sorry. real cool to, you know, that uh, when you make it, how do you guys record it? You guys record live in a room, track by track. Um, our group, we, we, uh, we get together, we do, we're a trio, so we'll do the the tracks, like the, the drum tracks all live together, but the only thing that's tracked is the drums. Yeah, uh, and then you'll overdub. Yeah, so. And then we come, we piece by piece it, but all usually all together until it becomes vocals and guitars, and that's, I'll take care of that. Yeah, so there's, so the four of us have never been in the same room as Whoa. four people. Yeah. Right, it's all remote. So. Yeah. Like the glory is like, I'll send in a scratch track with a click to McDermott. We'll talk out how the feel is. Then it goes to Joe and then it shows up to me and Jay and me and Jay take a Monday and a Tuesday, a long Monday and a, and a shorter Tuesday. And by the end of Tuesday, that song is alive, right? The snap happens. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. The snap is the snap is what matters to me. It's that like this idea and these words, whether they're mine or Joe's or Jay's, um, and all of the playing just falls into place when that riff hits or when you find the riff and the organ part lines up. And, and you know, it might be a fucking glockenspiel part, the last minute of recording, or a fucking tambourine, but that tambourine completely changes the dynamic and the snap happens. Like, that's all... I think I really care about is, is, you know, it's the birth. It's the moment that song breathes. I think you know? that, yeah, no, it's, it's a beautiful experience for sure to like see this thing you wrote and like kind of heard in your head. And then like they see what the people one just to know you have a group of people that care enough about your idea to want to see it come to life. And then when you do see it come to life, there's like that. I, I totally get what you're saying. There's People no aside, like if nobody, if nobody was listening, which to be fair, not a lot of people are, you know, like. Well, I just mean the band. You know what I mean? Oh just, yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. Know, but, not even an audience. But the core, the core, the, yeah. the four or five of us. That's what matters when our, and when and you know the cool thing, like Joe and McDermott are pretty hands off on like guitar riff, piano part, whatever. They just let my mind and Jay's ears go. So, like, literally we've done all those songs. Joe has sent one note, like, I don't really like that piano part. And I think McDermott actually commented on the same piano part. He's like, you sure that's the part? Um, and it was something I couldn't play that we had to farm out. Like, mm. a, a buddy of ours played, and I was, like, waiting for that to happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. And it was just like the holder, but like, like, yeah, like there's been no arguments even on like, is that the guitar riff? Is that the right tone? Like everything has just been so organic and like perfect. That's, it's one to be working with like people of that caliber and know that they believe in your idea. You know what I mean? Let, and give you the ground to do it is a different, you know, it's, it's a, a, I can't imagine that on top of just seeing it come to life. You know what I mean? Yeah. You want some heartwarming fucking full circle shit? Yes. You ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> so I ripped home uh, 19th, 20th of July to go see, to play a show, do the record release and go see the Bouncing Souls. And I texted Gittleman. I was like, yo, like I got to grab your bass head and your cab. Do you want to meet me in Jersey? Let's go see the Souls. And he's like, okay, cool. Um, my father was in a band with Nate Albert from the Boston's cousin. Whoa. Okay. Uh, what was the band? 90, it, they were they were called Cathode Bob. Okay. And so we're talking like ninety five ish. Um. Somehow my dad got. I don't know if it was let's face it demos or. Uh, like pre release, but it was a cassette. And my my old man worked real hard and went with Jersey. Go down the the shore if you're from North Jersey for a week. My dad would drive us to the boardwalk every night and we like go play ski ball and games of chance and like ride a ride and get an ice cream cone. We got five bucks. Um, and 
that summer in particular, we listened to Let's Face It Every Day. Right? And uh, this past weekend, I was in Jersey and, and, and Joe... I'm a connoisseur of ice cream cones. I don't, you know. Yeah. I'm 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 the king of the sweets. Um, hey, and uh, right. Joe was like, "Yo, let's go get ice cream." And my our other buddy Joe Mayako, who does a lot of the layout for me, art and stuff, um, was with us. And I was like, "Yo, I'm gonna take you guys to place." And I drove that road thirty years later to get that same ice cream cone with the guy whose record essentially opened me up to like punk and alternative music. Like it was the coolest fucking thing. That's insane. Right? Like yeah. that summer, my, my dad's a rocker, right? Like yeah. that summer we were listening to like an outcome the wolves and, um, and, uh, and, and let's face it. And, um, a couple other like really, like there was a bad religion record on repeat. No effects. So long. And thanks for all the shoes. Thanks for all the shoes was on repeat a lot that summer. Yeah. Uh, and we were like driving yeah. that road thirty years later to get that same fucking ice cream cone. It's like holy shit. Like that. Those summer nights shaped my love for music. And now, like, I'm here with the guy who wrote a bunch of those songs and played on that record. Whose band that was? Going to see the drummer of our band's old band play who I also love to the point that I have their logo tattooed on the palm of my hand. Damn, dude. Right? Like, yeah, it's real cool. It's real fucking magical. Uh, every chance is, it, it, you know, every, 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 every chance we get to sit and talk songwriting or like hear stories of like the Boston's or gangrene or, or, you know, McDermott with Murphy's Law or the Slackers or Django or the Souls. Anytime those stories come out, it's just like, holy fuck, like, cool. I can't this even. This rules. Yeah, man. I can't even know? imagine. That's so sick. Yeah. Uh, and we all get to play music and create, and it's, 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 it's just, it's pretty magical. Honestly, if, and, if that doesn't become a song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, At least the ice cream trip. That sounds like it should be a song, man. That's <laughs> that's uh that that same ice cream cone I wrote about on Civil War. Yeah, that's what the last song on Civil. War, it's called an orange swirl. Uh, okay, all right, never mind. Same boardwalk, same boardwalk, same yeah. same heart, uh, but not. I think that was more of a sorrow song than a, a, a stoked song. Yeah, yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> But sorry, I cut you off. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. You're good. Um, man, Sammy, thank you so much for chatting with me and giving me some of your time. No problem. It's been a pleasure to dive into your career, and I'm super stoked to for the show on September 4th at the Mahals because we do appreciate Mahals, and I wasn't joined the bash. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm stoked. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up going to see shows at a bowling alley. In yeah. Jersey. So any what, chance there's a rock and roll venue with bowling attached, I'm fucking in. What bowling alley? Uh, it was called the Asbury Lanes. Okay. And who like who are the shows? What were you seeing there? Was it local stuff? The first show I saw there, which I think was the first or second show, was against me. Oh, in sick, like, dude. Oh, yeah. four or something like that. But like, it was the Souls Hideout. Uh, it was a bunch of bands hideout that there was always cool shit going on. Like I saw half the clash play there at one point. I saw, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, Jelly Bay Afra. We played a show there. I played a solo show there once with Glenn from the sex pistols, Jez Kadena from black flag. And yeah. One of the New York dolls. Like it was just a holdout. Um, it was like a 1950s bowling alley. They never updated. You just put a stage on the middle four lines. All right, for the bowling alley, we're going to rock it hard, man. We're going to bring all yeah, that. It'll be good. That, it'll be fun. Was it? Oh, one thing I want to say. I really liked, I really liked your Misfits EP. I thought yeah. That was, yeah, I thought that was super sick. That was really cool to hear those songs, like, taken out of the bar chord shape and with this beautiful, like, adding the minor. You know, like, that was really yeah, well done. Yeah, it's a cool, uh, it's the, the concept of, a, you know, a perfect song and just how it's portrayed. Yeah. Like, some of those songs are, like, Astro Zombies is a perfectly written song. Yeah. 
Minus the the rape and yeah yeah minus killing the, lines maybe but, vocab but <laughs> yeah but the sentiment like that's the most perfect breakup song I think ever the chorus and the tag is just epic yeah and it's it's not you can't hear it without it being stuck in your head and like yeah just how it like it get like I guess when going it's metaphoric right but we're cutting to that point like. The language is precise. Dude, all I wanted to say, all I got to say, all, all I want to know, all I got to say, who did I do this for? Hey, me or you? Like, fuck. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> all I want to know, like, it's all I want. Like, that's fucking perfect. That's the end of something important. Yeah. yeah. Phrased. Perfectly, and like it, it, it's one, yeah, no, the, and the, you can place yourself in that. You can find that that can resonate with just about anybody, <laughs> minus exactly. the, the zombies or not. You know what I mean? Like, oh, man. yeah, exactly. Well, I don't, I, I can't think of a better way to cap this, man. Sammy, thank you again so much. I really pre- yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, so, appreciate you. You've been so flexible with this, and this has been. <clears throat> no, no, you're good. I appreciate you, man. The missus is is sick. Um, yeah. So, uh, just being able to be like, Hey man, I don't know if I'll actually do it that day. And like, have you be like, yeah, whatever you need, but I appreciate that. You know? Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you space cowboy. Bang.